Welcome to The Music Reel. I'm your host, Nicola Burton, and today my very special guest is Dr. Christina Balico. Now, Christina is the research fellow on the project Making Music Work. The findings of this were released to the public this week. Now, this research project was conducted between about three and four years and was led by the Queensland Conservatorium Research Centre, Griffith University, and with industry partners like the Australia Council for the Arts. So, Christina, welcome to The Music Reel. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much for having me. Well, I'm very interested in adding your voice to this conversation and hearing about this project because, look, here we are right now in this crazy time when there's so much uncertainty over the music industry. So this Making Music Work project, I really want to understand, number one, what was it that actually inspired this project to come about in the first place? And number two, what were the findings that you came across? So the main driver of this was a recognition of the portfolio nature of musicians' careers. So a portfolio career is when you're holding down a range of different jobs in order to sustain a living and also to sustain yourself creatively. We do need to look at those non-financial factors when it comes to a diverse career. And the main findings really have to do with the elements of, you know, the number of, of roles that musicians hold, the kinds of decisions making processes they go through as they traverse a career and also elements to do with the challenges associated with having a career you know financial security or rather lack thereof mm -hmm. um, you know the motiv motivations intrinsic motivations around pursuing what you love 90% of our survey respondents were doing this because it's what they love to do um, so you know there's those kinds of things and we have a range of recommendations around how to implement you know other elements of, of our findings around funding around educational aspects as well um, to support musicians in a whole suite of options um, to ensure that they can have strong, vibrant and flexible, long-lasting careers as well. No, that, it's great to hear because I mean, we, I, we've run our agency for the last 30 years. So we've seen a lot happen in that time, a lot of different trends and cycles and, and I guess behaviours as a result. And finance is, is, is the number one challenge, I think, because you love it, but you don't necessarily get the financial return that you would for another job. And I guess the challenge for our industry is we don't have one central source of data. So when it comes to funding pathways, the government doesn't necessarily know what's when, you know, they don't really drill down to the ordinary everyday musician. So they don't necessarily have that data, which is why I find this so fascinating. So can you tell us a little bit about the findings of this making music work? <laughs> Less than one in five of the musicians that responded to our survey um, actually work on a continuing or what we would consider a salaried basis, which really does show the number of and the percentage of, uh, you know, contract work, short-term work, self-employment right. and, and those kinds of things, which do, do add to those challenges around financial security and financial security you know was a really strong factor in whether or not musicians actually wanted to remain in their careers we found that the highest number there was 30% uh, of respondents were sort of saying the reason that they would leave music is because of financial stress and and a lack of income so the lack of understanding uh, outside of you know the the sector of musicians at least yeah. around these financial pressures the ways in which musicians actually make money and those kinds of things is you know really important that we actually address and understand it yeah and another thing as well that speaks to your comment on uh government's understanding musicians careers is that when we look at census data this is a huge hole that we have is that if a musician isn't making their primary source of income from music they can't answer that they're a musician on the census. So we actually have, and this isn't just specific to Australia, we find this, you know, quite often across the world. Hmm. And so there are recommendations there around actually adding additional options within, you know, these longitudinal studies such as census and even graduate outcome surveys to get a better sense of the number of people who are, who are engaging in, in music hmm. as, as an art form and as, you know, a career, whether it is, you know, we also can't exclude, you know, hobbyists. We get a lot of enrichment of our cultures from music. So not everyone that's necessarily pursuing music is doing it to pursue a career. Um, you know, some right. of them are doing it in order to, to be creatively fulfilled as well. And that's a very valid thing. I think if we're going to use, you know, if the litmus test is you're pursuing something because you enjoy it, which therefore means it's not a valid option, 
there's so many careers that do or don't make money, um, yeah. you know, that people do because they love it. Are we going to try and say that medical doctors aren't allowed to be medical doctors because they love what they do? You know, so, I mean, obviously we all contribute to culture and society in different ways, but, you know, that is a real challenge there when there's this attitude of, well, just because you love it uh, doesn't mean that it's valid or important when it actually is because we're seeing now when we're not able to go out and engage mm. in, in watching live music and we're having to reconsider the ways in which we actually engage with one another as a society uh, that, you know, we are really lacking something when we can't go and meet and connect with people over, over a show and, and in these, these live music spaces. So that, it, it really is quite a significant study, isn't it? Mm. It's raising so many questions. I didn't even think about that. With the census, if you are only a part-timer, you can't mm. really write that down. And it's yeah. so important for the government to understand the real data of, of the real people who are actually in this music workforce. I think that's yeah. one of the reasons why we're doing the music reel is to try and get that real voice out there so people know, hang on a minute, it's not just the people on a red carpet it's the ordinary, everyday people with small businesses and mortgages and families that are the ones that are actually holding this industry together. So I guess my last question for you is, look, we've got this crazy 2020, this lockdown that's completely stopped, March 13th, good, you know, Black Friday, there you go. No gigs since then. What do you think, like you've seen this, these findings, what's your vision in terms of, um, I guess, the industry, so agents, managers and the artists themselves or even arts organisations, what can we do to better equip music artists to be able to deal with this changed industry ecosystem post-COVID? Well, I think that, you know, one thing that did come out of this is that musicians are really resilient. And I don't think necessarily that it's about us having to change anything from the perspective of musicians. It's actually a broader change. It's having musicians being able to get access to things like JobKeeper. It's uh, musicians being supported in the same way that, you know, we had a whole range of bushfires happen late last year and early, early this year, which is very tragic and heartbreaking. But who are the people that end up going out there and doing the gigs to raise the money the to help? Exactly, it's the That's musicians. Right. And so we need to return that, that kindness and that, that respect and that understanding that, you know, we do value musicians, we do value arts and culture in Australia. So the musicians absolutely have the skill sets. If you look at a musician that's working, you know, three or four different jobs, their capacity to undertake a whole range of business administration skills, self-management, negotiating different contracts and those kinds of things, even if it is them doing it themselves or knowing when to engage with other people, engaging in mentoring and mentorship opportunities, uh, engaging in educational opportunities, really being committed to upskilling. Musicians do have the toolkit and the, the ability to actually be resilient in this setting. The bigger issue is that as a society, what they need isn't being reflected back to them. They can't get access to, you know, to things like JobKeeper. We've obviously had this announcement yesterday of, you know, this, this massive arts package, but we do also need to see ways in which musicians can access financial supports and things like that in a much easier and much more streamlined way. The fact that they haven't been able to for months on end it is very concerning and it does raise questions about what is it going to mean if musicians are going, right, well, I can't continue to pursue my music career because as we saw when the lockdown started, you know, musicians were having gigs cancelled for six months. It wasn't just a let's put a hold on this. I have people in my networks who were going, I have nothing for six months. And yeah. their bread and butter was actually playing, you know, an acoustic cover set in the corner in their local pub, That's which is right. a very valid form of music performance and things like that. And all of a sudden that's gone so what is that person going to do they, they're obviously still going to love music but are they going to decide well i'm not going to pursue that and for musicians that are at very critical junctures of their career you know where they don't have that capacity to keep trying to invest in this and this is the thing that makes them go mm, no we are going to lose out as a society so the bigger thing you know is that we need to it's not the musicians that need to it's that the support networks around them need to lift them up and be there right. to actually um, provide that support for them to get to get everyone, you know, through through this really difficult space because, you know, some of the lockdowns are ending, you know, to some degree now we are able to start having different kinds of performances and that's an exciting opportunity. But realistically, you know, touring, international touring, large-scale events, you know, things like that, 
they're not going to happen probably until at least next year, the middle of next year. That's right. So, so that's a you know that's that's a long time for people to to put a put a hole you know put a plug in it and just go okay well wait that not everyone has that capacity to do that exactly and what do they do in the meantime and that package that was released yesterday the ordinary everyday person who plays in that corner bar was exempt from that they don't have access to those funds so what happens to those people and that is the most important question I think you've raised with this conversation what is the value of music so I think as agents, as managers, as artists, as arts organisations and as society as a whole, if we can start to ask that question, what is the real value of music? And I think that's what I loved about your Making Music Work program, your project, is because it's actually helped us to start asking that question in a different way. Mm. Yeah. And the other thing as well I would also say, we also can't forget the support workers. You know, when we, when we think, you know, musicians... Are missing out on opportunities. There's a whole bunch of staging, you know, yeah. tech workers and things like that that are also missing out on work too. And then people that work behind the bars. So there is sort of this whole ecosystem that is being completely and totally disrupted. That's and while you know we might be disappointed, you know, I certainly um, was. I was. I was the day after the lockdown started. The, the international borders closed. I was expected to be on a flight to go to Phoenix to see Rage Against the Machine. Oh no! You know? So and that's a personal disappointment but you look at a band like that if they can't play and some of those first shows were uh, actually you know uh, the money was going to charities you look at the whole ecosystem that completely shuts down a band like that you know can weather the storm of of not playing shows but think about all the staging crew think about the people who actually lose their incomes when the artists aren't on stage that's the other thing as well and exactly yeah. This conversation is going to go on for a couple of years, I think, and it's, a, it's an important one because it is those real men and women behind the scenes that are falling through the cracks. They're the ones that we need to shine the spotlight on. So, Christina, what a great chat today. Thank you so much for taking your time and adding your voice to this very important conversation. I really appreciated it. Thank you so much, Nikki. And enjoy the rest of your birthday. Thank you. <laughs> See you, Christina. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Bye. Christina Balico, everyone. Thank you. Right. So